Shani um, is a multi-award winning inclusion um, specialist and has been named as one of UK's influential, most influential disabled people by the Shaw Trust and the 2020 um, BBC 100 list. She's a social entre entrepreneur who's um, founding a number of organisations to improve representation and to challenge social inequality. So organisations like um, Diversability, the Asian Women um, Festival and Asian Disability Network. It's really, really fantastic to have you um, today, Shani, to talk both personally and professionally um, about um, your experience of how we best identify and support consumers in vulnerable situations. So I'm going to hand over um, to Shani. Vulnerability. At-risk groups, clinically extremely vulnerable, hard-to-reach communities. These are all words and phrases that we have all heard a lot of over the last two years, along with headlines like these. And the impact of the pandemic on consumers' personal health and financial circumstances has pushed the issue up even higher on the agenda for both regulators and businesses. And they're really looking now at how we treat our existing and newly vulnerable consumers. And that's because COVID-19 has reversed the positive trend of vulnerability. Between March and October 2020, the number of adults with characteristics of vulnerability increased by 3.7 million bringing that total up to 27.7 million, meaning more than half of the UK adult population, 53% to be exact, are at greater risk of harm. And we know that the increase has been driven by people experiencing negative life events, particularly redundancy, uh, reduced working hours. And in October 2020, 14.2 million people have had low financial resilience. That's an increase of 3.5 million from February 2020. And we already know that the factors that make a consumer vulnerable are very rarely static, meaning that they can get better or worse over time. But the impact of COVID-19 has increased both the incidence and the complexity of vulnerabilities. And even though I was born with a rare genetic condition, I never really considered myself to be vulnerable. But as soon as I was old enough to become financially literate, that's when it all changed for me. I went to a special needs primary school because that's what inclusion was 30 odd years ago. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely loved it. I played all day. And I remember the teachers saying things to me like, oh, you've read all the books in the school. And then it wasn't until I went to a mainstream secondary school did I think that maybe that wasn't the right place for my learning needs. But in order for me to go to a mainstream secondary school, I had to have an electric wheelchair because suddenly I was going from a class size of eight to a school full of thousands of kids. But that electric wheelchair cost £7,000. That might not seem a lot of money for some people, but I'm a child of immigrants and my family were in survival mode. And £7,000 was a lot of money for my parents who were working manual labour jobs and they're still in those same jobs today. And I felt really guilty I felt like that money could have gone perhaps towards the next family car. No one made me feel guilty about it, but I guess when you're in that situation and that's all you've ever known, that's the emotions that come with it. And vulnerability <coughs> compounds when you're, issue, when you're faced with issues with money and finances. And my money worry started at 11, but really came into force at 16, when I really struggled to enter the job market. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I left school, because my, my childhood was just focused on my health, 
So I have a condition where my bones used to break without any trauma. So every year I used to break my leg, not on purpose. And then in being recovery and then learn how to walk again, just to do it again the next year and the next year and the next year. But then at 16, I'd, I'd had surgeries, I'd had treatment. So I was no longer in that cycle of breaking. And all of a sudden the world was my oyster. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I, was, I went off to college, but I was also trying to get some part-time work because you know, we all need money, right? So I had one sentence on my covering letter that said, I've got a condition, but it doesn't affect my ability to do this role. And you've got to take into consideration, I was really looking at the jobs that I couldn't, couldn't and, and could do. I'd obviously only apply for the jobs that I could do, whereas, you know, my friends would be applying for jobs like waitressing and things like that. I knew I couldn't do that. And it got to the point where I had applied for over 100 jobs, but I hadn't heard anything back. Now, it didn't make sense to me. I wanted to work, I can work, and I had every enthusiasm to work as well. So I did an experiment and I took that one sentence off my covering letter. And by the way, I only put it on there to help other people feel less awkward. Because obviously the first thing you see when you meet me is the fact that I've got a short stature. So I took that sentence off and I got offered an interview and got a job straight away. So at 16, I had to learn a really harsh life lesson that not only are people going to judge my ability based on my appearance, but how was I going to survive financially? If I'd struggled to get a part-time, entry-level job that needed no qualifications, how was I going to live? I didn't want to live at home with my parents forever. I love them, but you know, wanted my own life. And it left me feeling hopeless. It left me feeling like, oh, I'll always have to live with them at home and who's going to die first, me or them? No 16-year-old should ever have to think that. So that's when I went to university because I thought I had to have a degree to fall back on. So I guess it's, it's fair to say I've, I've always overcompensated. And now my next worry is, well, how long will I be able to work for until my health decides, uh, you know, it, it's time to give up working? And now my work has led me to advocate for disabled people, but also the, the extra costs that we face because I don't think it's fair that disabled people have to pay more to live the same lives as others, but have less or no choice. On average, disabled people face unavoidable extra costs of £583 a month more. So you know we've got all this new narrative about the cost of living crisis. Well, nobody cared about disabled people's cost of living crisis for all these years. So it's like a bit of a double whammy for us. £583 is a lot of money for a lot of people, especially when disabled people are twice as likely to be unemployed, have to apply for 60% more jobs, and nearly half of everyone in poverty in this country is disabled, and welfare doesn't touch the size of the support that you need. So what this works out to be is, on average, £100 for a non-disabled person is equivalent to about £68 for a disabled person. So... As a consultant, I work with businesses and brands and I help them to become more inclusive, not only for their disabled employees, but also their customers. And I'm also launching a discount platform for disabled people to save money. So it's essentially what a student discount card is for students, but for disabled people. But not only am I doing it because I want to help people, look at the amount of money businesses are losing. £274 billion a year to the UK economy. I want to phone Rishi soon, I can tell him that now. <laughs> I'm sure he'd make some different decisions. And this group of disabled people is estimated to be rising 14% per year because 80% of disabled people were not born with a condition or an impairment. I'm one of the 20% that was. So... What that's telling you is your non-disabled employees and your non-disabled customers could very well go on to experience disability or have a family member that does. And the, the, 
the problem that businesses have is that they just don't have enough data to understand disabled consumers. And less than 10% of organisations even have a targeted plan on how to access the Purple Pound. But for me, the fact that businesses are overlooking this purely from a commercial perspective, let alone moral perspective, I think it just goes to show how overlooked disabled and vulnerable consumers are. Because, you know, despite service providers, uh, businesses and retailers being largely inaccessible for me, I'm not stood in front of you today naked, even though I can't go into a shop and buy and wear clothes off a rail. I still find a way to spend that money somewhere. I've still got food at home in my cupboards. But retailers and businesses and service providers can be really hard to access for some people. But just think about how much time and effort is spent on that for me and other consumers not only in a monetary sense, but also my time. And time's the most valuable thing that we all have. I don't want to keep spending it on buying clothes and tailoring it or having to ask for adaptions everywhere I need to go. But let's just look at the market size. As I've already mentioned, 80% of people acquire their conditional impairment. So that means around 20% of your consumers or your customers will be disabled right now. And 83% of disabled consumers choose to shop with retailers that support disabled people and value their needs. Customers in vulnerable circumstances will be less able to represent their own interests, and they're more likely to suffer from harm than the average consumer. And this is an area where you need to take action to create good outcomes for all consumers. Now, I want to explain why I've got this slide up, because just like how disability affects all of us, so can vulnerability. And just like how disability doesn't discriminate who it affects, neither does vulnerability. So let me explain. Let's take touch, for example. So these are all the, the senses, touch, see, hear, and speak. But let's focus on touch. You can see three columns, permanent, temporary, and situational. And this is how disability affects us all. So under permanent, you've got someone who's got one arm. So they've got upper limb loss. So they permanently only have the use of their other arm. Under temporary, you can see that somebody's got an arm injury. So let's say for six weeks, They've also only got the use of one arm. And under situational, you can see there's a new parent and they're holding a baby. So let's say, okay, I struggle with opening doors. I need, two, I need two arms to open doors because doors are pretty heavy for me. One to pull the handle and one to push the door. So let's say all of these three people needed to do the same thing. In that moment, they would all be experiencing the same disability because it's not our conditions and impairments that disable us, it's inaccessible design and it's the bias that people have. <coughs> We've spoken a little bit there about how we spot exclusion. And you know, automatic doors are brilliant for me, my, both my arms are free and automatic doors would work for all three of those people too. But approaches to supporting vulnerable customers can't be a blanket approach because if you get it wrong, you risk marginalising customers, harming them and breaching the regulations. So inclusive design has the potential to transform the way that markets, products and services work to deliver significantly improved outcomes for people in vulnerable circumstances. Again, let me talk you through this. So you've got three boxes and you can see there's people from three different heights trying to see the football game. On the very first box, this is an example of equality. It's assumed that everyone's starting from the same point, so they've all been given the same support. But as you can tell, not everyone can still see the game. So this is an example of, of how equality doesn't always work. In the middle box, this is an example of, being, of treating people with equity. 
their individual needs have been taken into account and they've all been given the different individual support that they need. Now everyone can see the game, which is good, but the world that I want to live in is this world where the systemic barrier has been removed because the design of the fence has changed. Now no one needs to ask for any supports because as I mentioned earlier, it's pretty exhausting and time consuming. And universal design or inclusive design, I think is the key to really meeting the needs of all consumers, especially those that are vulnerable. And inclusive design is nothing new, by the way. Many of the things that we all enjoy and use today have been created for disabled people, like the typewriter, that was created to help someone who was blind write a letter because obviously they couldn't, they couldn't write with a pen and paper. Then the typewriter uh, became the keyboard, which what we, is something that we all use every single day. So inclusive design is already in our society, but that's not how we see it. And taking customer needs into account is shown to provide more positive consumer experiences and outcomes, increasing retention, reducing complaints and enhancing reputation, and of course, lowering the cost of your customer acquisition. So if you haven't already realised, there's a lot to do. <laughs> but how do you take all of that understanding and turn it into action? Well, within these four elements that PwC have suggested, these are some of the things that I think and others think that you should be looking at. Establishing or updating your vulnerable customer policy and get it spoken at, at board level. You need to get that senior buy-in and make it a priority because once it's at board level, it stays a priority then and get a senior champion as well behind this work. You need to build in a staff training process and not just a one-off thing. It needs to be regular and tailor your communication strategy because that's what's critical in supporting your vulnerable customers. The average UK reading, reading age in, across the country is of a nine-year-old. Use easy to understand language and avoid jargon. Establish a vulnerable customer action plan. It will help you prioritise what you need to work on in what order and it outlines the steps to achieve a fairer outcome. Definitely signpost to external support, develop support for your staff as well, because this is heavy and can sometimes be very distressing work for your, you know, your frontline workers too. And of course, monitor and review all of the above, improve it where you can and ensure that all your staff are meeting vulnerable customers' needs. The last thing that I want to talk to you today is about intersectionality. Because amongst vulnerable customers, the pain isn't being shared equally. Some groups are way more disproportionately affected by vulnerability than others. And a good way for us to understand this better is through the lens of intersectionality. You've probably heard of this term now, especially after the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. Personally, I've been banging on about this for 10 years, so I'm really glad that people know about it now. But in case you don't, it refers to the nature of how personal characteristics, such as all these, gender, race, age, nationality, how they all intersect um, and overlap to shape really dynamic ways that each individual experiences the world. So it stops siloing people into separate groups. Because I'm a South Asian disabled woman, but many approaches to meeting my needs will always be from disability. But that's not the lens I experience the world through. Tomorrow, I can't wake up and decide, I'll just leave my disability at the door today. It doesn't work like that. And a higher than average proportion of younger people and adults from ethnic minority backgrounds became vulnerable since March 2020. 60% of those showing low financial capability were women. 34% of black adults had low financial resilience compared with 19% of white adults. And nearly 50% of those living in poverty are disabled or live with a disabled family member. So now imagine you are a black disabled woman. Imagine the potential spectrum of risk or potential amount of vulnerability that you could be exposed to. 
And using an intersectional approach gives you a more nuanced picture of vulnerabilities and into vulnerable groups. And it can help inform vulnerable it can help you inform vulnerable groups in a particular way, taking into account the differences that all coexist in these groups as well. I truly believe that if we want to get to a place of true inclusion, it has to be intersectional. Otherwise, it's, it's kind of a wasted effort. So it's our collective responsibility to remove the barriers that people face. Hopefully you've seen from my story, my conditions never stop me from doing anything. It's been the world, it's been people's bias, it's been inaccessibility. And it's in our own interest to be allies to people from diverse and oppressed and vulnerable groups because everybody's struggles are tied to each other's. Don't forget that every single decision that we all individually make can either raise or lower barriers to participation in society and vulnerability. Everyone deserves access to fair, flexible and inclusive services. So what action will you take? Thank you.